Darkcast Network, bringing our indie podcasts out of the shadows. Thursday the 12th of May 1988 was a day when not only the residents of the city of Aberdeen but people from all over the country came together to mourn the great loss of 59-year-old gentle Sister Josephine Ogilvie who a week earlier had been killed in a most violent and brutal way with some of her injuries so severe that they normally would be found on victims of road traffic accidents. But who would want to so severely attack and kill the kindly Sister Josephine? Now sadly, as seems to be the case a lot of the time, I wasn't able to find a lot of information about Sister Josephine Ogilvie, the victim, but most of what I did find came from the book Blood and Granite by Norman Adams. Josephine Ogilvie was a primary school teacher, having qualified in 1953. However, Josephine decided to merge her two loves, religion and teaching, and she became Sister Josephine Ogilvie, or Sister Josie, as she was affectionately known. Josephine originated from Edinburgh, and her order was the Society of the Sacred Heart. Around 1985, however, she took up a new appointment and began working out of St Mary's Roman Catholic Cathedral and Pastoral Centre in Huntley Street in Aberdeen as a religious education adviser. Aberdeen is located on the northeast of Scotland, and Sister Josie resided about a 17-minute drive south of Aberdeen in Port Lathan. Despite St Mary's Cathedral being Sister Josie's base, her religious education work took her all over the northeast of Scotland and the Northern Isles. Sister Josie was a wonderful teacher and had a great relationship with children, with children also being particularly fond of the silver-haired, glasses-wearing Sister Josie who always seemed to have a twinkle in her eye, a smile on her face and displayed a great sense of humour. Having spent three years teaching the love of God and the service of neighbour in the whole community to children of primary age in and around Aberdeen, Sister Josie felt that she had fulfilled her vision and was ready to take her learnings and teachings back to her hometown of Edinburgh, with her due to leave for her new appointment in Edinburgh in the next few weeks. However, until it was time for her to leave, she continued her work, which is what she had been doing on Friday the 6th of May 1988. She had left her home in Port Lathan about 8.30am and spent much of the day teaching at the Pastoral Centre, which adjoined St Mary's Roman Catholic Cathedral, before heading to the first floor office she shared with Father Colin Stewart, where she busied herself with paperwork. About 3pm, Father Colin Stewart made his way to the office he shared with Sister Josie. However, upon trying to push the office door open, he found that it was stuck. No, not stuck. It was being held shut by someone on the other side. Father Stewart instantly suspected that a burglar was on the other side of the door, and so he rushed down to raise the alarm, where he bumped into cathedral caretaker Felix Graham and told him what was happening. Before the pair could go back up the stairs to try to get into the office, they happened to see a man making his way hurriedly down the fire escape that led from the shared office, before jumping over a wall and disappearing. Father Stewart and Mr Graham were alarmed at what they saw as the man they had seen coming down the fire escape was not wearing a top and his face and chest were covered with blood. In a panic now, the two men ran back up the stairs, made their way to the shared office door and pushed it open. Mark Reynolds was brought up by his devout Catholic parents, Arthur and Stella, in a rough area of Liverpool, which is in the northwest of England. While as a young boy, Mark Reynolds had been a choir boy, according to the Blood and Granite book, as a juvenile, he had appeared in court for offences of dishonesty. And while still living in England, Mark Reynolds' parents had signed a documentation that had him admitted to hospital for treatment of drug abuse. In 1978, when a job opportunity came up for Mark's father to work on the oil rigs off Aberdeen, Mark's parents jumped at the chance in the hope it would be a new start for their son and put him back on the right path. Upon moving to Aberdeen, Mark's mother, Stella, became a regular at St Mary's Roman Catholic Cathedral and became known to the nuns who worked there, one such nun being Sister Mary MacDonald, who also worked as a social worker for St Mary's Cathedral and who had been happy to speak with Mark Reynolds when his mum told her of the struggles he was having with drink and drugs. 
However, before long, Mark's mother's worst fears were becoming a reality, as Mark had, according to the courier and advertiser on the 23rd of August 1988, began to drift into a life of crime and drugs and would practice satanic rites. He also had become obsessed with ninjutsu, which is an outlawed Japanese martial art, and he owned the ritualistic black uniform, red headband, flails, and butterfly knives, which according to the Blood and Granite book, were associated with the ninja warriors of feudal Japan. He also liked to watch disturbing videos which featured the ninja warriors' dubious exploits. Mark was eventually asked to leave the family home, and he went on to stay in squats and guest houses, preferring to sleep in the darkest places he could find, such as in cupboards. He was known to wear a crucifix upside down and would tell people that he was the Antichrist and that he hated religion and religious people. By 1988, Mark Reynolds had perfected his outfit, taking to wearing, according to the Courier and Advertiser and Daily Mirror in 1988, a ninja headband, combat trousers and army boots, or all black leather outfits, sported bizarre hairstyles and would carry a ghetto blaster around with him. On Friday the 6th of May, Mark Reynolds had spent most of the day drinking in three bars around Aberdeen, with a witness later saying that Mark had appeared to be high on something, before he then made his way to St Mary's Cathedral and bumped into 68-year-old caretaker Felix Graham shortly after 2pm. Felix asked the strange man what he wanted, who, according to the Blood and Granite book, was wearing a silver stud in his left nostril, an earring in his left ear, and his hair at that time was cropped to his skull. Felix noted when the stranger replied that he was looking for a small nun that he spoke with a Liverpool accent. Felix thought that it was Sister Mary MacDonald who this man was looking for, who was also a social worker and who had worked with Mark previously. However, Sister Mary was not at the cathedral at that point, and Felix told the man this repeatedly, telling him also that he couldn't wait at the cathedral for her. But Mark Reynolds insisted he would wait for her, and took a seat outside Sister Josephine's office. Felix was not happy with this manic man, who was clearly under the influence of drink and possibly drugs, hanging around, but he refused to move even when ordered to by Felix who in actual fact had been an ex-amateur boxer in his day so he could potentially handle himself. However, Felix did not want to cause a scene where people were seeking peace and so he left the man waiting outside Sister Josephine's office for the time being, expecting that he would get bored eventually, but Felix intended to keep an eye on this strange man. At some point within the hour, Sister Josephine must have gone out into the hall area and noticed this young man sitting there waiting. She possibly knew that Sister Mary wasn't around and so perhaps asked this young man if he wanted to come into a room for a chat. And he must have said yes as that was why he had gone to the cathedral to speak to Sister Mary as he was feeling a bit depressed and she had been good enough to speak to him before. However it happened, Mark Reynolds made his way inside Sister Josie's room and they had started talking. However, Mark Reynolds later said that he lost his head while speaking to Sister Josie, at which point he approached Sister Josie and began to savagely attack and sexually assault her. Mark Reynolds was then disturbed by Father Stewart trying to get in the room, and so when Father Stewart moved away from the door, Mark Reynolds took his chance and grabbed his top, not having time to put it on, jumped out of the window in the office, hurried down the fire escape, and jumped over the high wall, before running back to the guest house he was staying at in D Street, which was a four-minute walk away. When Father Stewart and Felix Graham opened the door of Sister Josie's shared office, they were shocked by the sight that met them. Sister Josie was lying on her back, half naked, her arms spread out as though she had been crucified and was covered in bruises, bite marks and blood. She had been so badly and severely attacked that she was unrecognisable. Father Stuart quickly covered Sister Josie with his jacket and put her in the recovery position, while Felix Graham called the police and an ambulance, although Father Stuart had already realised that it was too late and that Sister Josie was dead. Following a post-mortem, it revealed that Mark Reynolds had ripped off most of Sister Josie's clothing and her rosary beads before sexually assaulting her. 
he then, according to the Blood and Granite book, knocked her to the ground, struck her repeatedly on the face, neck and body with his hands, arms and feet, compressed her throat with his hands, jumped and stamped on her body, bit her, severed her ear with scissors and stabbed her repeatedly with the same scissors. All in all, Sister Josie suffered 60 separate injuries, which included eight broken ribs and a fractured spine with these injuries normally being found in victims of traffic accidents. It was also revealed that Sister Josie had fought hard for her life, trying desperately to stop the horrific attack on her, with an article in the Daily Mirror in 1988 saying that furniture in the office had been smashed and Bibles, books and church literature were scattered around her office. Mercifully, it was revealed that Sister Josie had died early in the attack, as according to the Blood and Granite book, she had suffered a cardiac arrest, which had been caused by a major injury to her neck, which resulted in a fractured larynx. The police were quickly on the scene. Sister Josie and her good work was very well known within the city and beyond, and so everyone wanted whoever had so savagely attacked and murdered this gentle and kindly sister caught. Father Stuart and the caretaker Felix Graham were able to give a pretty good description of the man, as well as the fact he had a Liverpudlian accent. They had seen him fleeing down the fire escape, half dressed and covered in blood, and so this description, along with an appeal for anyone with information on who this man was or where he may be, to come forward. Less than two hours later, a local shopkeeper came forward to say that a man matching this description had bought alcohol in his shop and that he believed the man lived in a guest house in the area. Armed with this information, the police carried out door-to-door -door inquiries and it didn't take them long to find out exactly who this man was, 23-year-old Mark Reynolds, and that he was currently living in a guest house in D Street. Believing they were dealing with a very dangerous man, the police quickly moved into the property and found Mark Reynolds, not on the attack and dangerous though, but according to the daily record on the 1st of July 2012, sitting quite calmly in his underwear, eating a leftover curry with blood still splattered on his chest and face, scratches that had been inflicted by Sister Josephine on his face and with his clothes already in the washing machine being cleaned. He apparently didn't resist being arrested and charged with Sister Josephine's murder, but merely stated that he had taken LSD and cannabis, although later blood tests showed only cannabis was in his system. According to the Blood and Granite book, he also said that he had done a terrible thing, but that he didn't want to talk about it. Although this changed three days later while he was being held at the local prison when he had apparently said to a prison warden, I wakened this morning and realised I was a killer, that I had strangled someone. It had taken the police three hours from being called out to arresting Sister Josephine's murderer, but the news that Sister Josephine had been murdered had spread much faster than that, and the residents of Aberdeen, regardless of religion, were shocked, outraged and extremely saddened by Sister Josephine's atrocious murder. But in the hours and days after Sister Josephine's murder, the then Bishop of Aberdeen appealed and preached for calm, peace and forgiveness. While Mark Reynolds appeared in court and was officially accused and charged with murdering Sister Josephine before being remanded in custody for the murder trial, Sister Josephine's funeral took place at St Mary's Cathedral on Thursday the 12th of May 1988. Mourners came from all over the country to pay their respects and show love for Sister Josephine Ogilvie. According to an article in the Evening Express on the 12th of May 1988, at least 1,000 people were there for Sister Josie's funeral, with the cathedral being almost overflowing with old and young people from all walks of life and children who had been allowed to leave school early, with one wee boy being seen crying his eyes out as he walked into the cathedral with his mum. Everyone had united in their affection for the kind Sister Josie, who meant so much to so many. Sister Josephine was buried by Father Colin Stewart in Aberdeen's Allenvale Cemetery, not in her hometown of Edinburgh, as according to Sister Kilroy, who was one of Sister Josie's sisters in her religious congregation, we are buried where we die, among our people with whom we have worked. 
the message of forgiveness and peace that was being preached as much as possible following the awful murder of Sister Josie seemed to have gotten through. But to further promote this, after the funeral, Mark Reynolds' mother, Stella, who was deeply religious and had been attending St Mary's since her move to Aberdeen, was presented with Sister Josie's rosary beads, with it being said that it was what Sister Josie would have wanted. Despite the united front and the message of forgiveness having been accepted by not only members of St Mary's congregation, of not only Aberdeen residents but those across Scotland, following Sister Josie's funeral, all eyes then turned to the murder trial, which took place at the High Court in Aberdeen in August 1988, and everyone, young and old, again united. At the trial, the main outcome to be determined was whether Mark Reynolds was sane and to be charged with murder or whether he had diminished responsibility at the time of the murder and therefore be charged with culpable homicide. Two psychiatrists who had examined Mark Reynolds gave evidence at the trial, with one, Dr Raymond Antibi, saying, according to the Courier and Advertiser, that Mark Reynolds held bizarre beliefs and could not distinguish between right and wrong going on to say, according to the Blood and Granite book, that the killing of Sister Josie had been as a result of a sudden impulse occurring in a mind in chaos. The other psychiatrist, Dr John Baird, who was from Carstairs State Hospital, explained that Mark Reynolds had been diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1982 and had been prescribed medication for this. However, he wouldn't always take this. Mark Reynolds had also apparently told Dr Antibi that he would regularly take LSD, smoke cannabis and drink heavily, and apparently the night before the murder he had not gone to sleep, but instead stayed up all night watching sadistic videos, smoking cannabis and taking painkillers, before then spending the following day drinking to excess in pubs with it being stated in the Daily Mirror on the 23rd of August 1988 that it was believed he had been acting out a violent fantasy the afternoon he had brutally attacked and murdered Sister Josephine, and that drugs might have contributed to his condition, but also could have been masking his mental illness. Both psychiatrists ended by recommending that Mark Reynolds be detained in Carstairs State Mental Hospital. The defence also agreed with this recommendation, saying that anything said to try to mitigate what Mark Reynolds had done would either be irrelevant or offensive, going on to state that it's quite clear that Mark Reynolds is very ill indeed. Subsequently, the charge of murder was reduced to culpable homicide of Sister Josephine Ogilvie, as it was deemed that Mark Reynolds had diminished responsibility at the time of the murder, to which Mark Reynolds pleaded guilty. He also admitted two serious sexual offences before being sent to Carstairs State Mental Hospital without limit of time. Mark Reynolds had sat emotionless throughout the trial and upon being told he would be sent to Carstairs State Mental Hospital without limit of time. While nobody would blame Arthur and Stella Reynolds for disowning their son after what he had done, the couple refused to do this and visited him during him being held in remand. Following the court case, Mrs Reynolds continued to go to St Mary's, where she would pray for her son and his victim, and she received nothing but compassion from the congregation. While Sister Josephine was never forgotten and her good work went on, with the pastoral centre attached to St Mary's Cathedral now being called the Ogilvy Centre, possibly a coincidence as I can't find anything that says this was named after Sister Josephine Ogilvy, but I'd like to think it's named after the kindly Sister Josie. The impact her brutal murder had on the congregation, and particularly Father Stuart, who had found Sister Josie's horrifically beaten body, was severe. However, over time, and through the whole community, not just Catholics, coming together and supporting one another, they came to a place where they could talk about what happened and not feel revulsion or fear. Although Mark Reynolds' actions towards Sister Josie had shown the evil that was in society, it had also shown up the good that is in society because of the amount of goodwill. Despite the positive ending, this was still such an awful story, and I can't leave you on such a sad note. So, to lighten the mood slightly, here's another... Dawn's Digest so I hope you've been enjoying our The Shorts-themed episodes this month. But would you like to know what February's theme is going to be? Yes! 
Okay then. It's a conclusions and catch-up theme. There has recently been a conviction for a murder that was committed in 1976, so we'll be telling you that story. We'll also be doing an episode where we will update you of any developments about any cases we have covered so far. Also, last year we did an episode on the murder on Goatfell Mountain on the Isle of Arran. I mentioned in that episode that I'd love to do a debate episode with what you, the listener, thought happened. Was Edwin pushed or did he fall and why do you think that? I've had a few people let me know what they thought but I'd love some more feedback and thoughts from you. So please let me know your opinion by emailing me at contact at scottishmurders.com or on social media facebook.com slash scottishmurders m-u-r-d-u-r-s instagram at scottishmurderspodcast or on twitter at scottishmurders by the 14th of february and i'll put together all your opinions and thoughts in a special episode for february i really look forward to hearing what you all thought so i hope you join us in february for all those episodes okay it's review time This one is from Liam's Biggest Fan and it reads I love this podcast. I was delighted to find a Scottish true crime podcast. Being from Glasgow myself, it feels a bit more at home. The narrator is perfect, her voice is lovely. I'm looking forward to catching up with every episode. That was such a great review and like I said, each review potentially brings someone new to Scottish murders so please if you have a minute, why not give us a review too and help others find Scottish murders. So in a previous Dawn's Digest, I told you that Scottish Murders had now joined the Darkcast Network. There are so many amazing podcasts on this network, so I'm going to tell you a bit more about them over the next few months. But I'm going to start with Smoke-Filled Rooms. This is a political true crime podcast hosted by Greg, and I've really been enjoying listening to this podcast. While it's still relatively new, having under 20 episodes released so far, the episodes are really good. Greg is a fantastic host who delivers episodes on topics that he has clearly thoroughly researched. Plus it does help that he has a background in political science and the production on each episode is top notch. I especially enjoyed the five-parter called Murdering Marilyn Monroe, The Kennedy Conspiracy Theory and I'm looking forward to listening to the seven parts of the Nuremberg Trials. You can find smoke-filled rooms wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if political true crime conspiracies interest you, then you will love this podcast. But don't take my word for it, here's Greg himself to tell you more. Hello everyone, my name is Gregory Zink, and I'd like to welcome you to my political true crime podcast called Smoke-Filled Rooms. With my background in political science... I present deep-dive storytelling shows that focus on history's most infamous governments, leaders, parties, policies, and discontents. For at the core of society's dysfunctions are the criminal powers that lord over us, and the attempts by competing interests to strike back at the system. So grab a couple cigars and meet me behind the Capitol building for bi-weekly episodes featuring the political realm's most diabolical. The Smoke-Filled Rooms podcast is a member of the Dark Cast Network and is available wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure to visit smokefilledrooms.net to sign up for my mailing list. Listener discretion is advised for topics including violence, coarse language, substance use, sex, and disturbing situations. We'll see you soon. I cannot recommend Smoke-Filled Rooms and Greg enough. You can find more fantastic Darkcast Network podcasts at darkcastnetwork.com. Well, we hope you've enjoyed January's themed episodes and the introduction of Dawn's Digest. Join us on the 14th of February, ooh, that's Valentine's Day, for our next episode.
Scottish Murders is a production of Clurin Torn.